Um, I'm Peter Ellsworth. I'm stationed at the Maricopa Agricultural Center and out of the Department of Entomology. And I'm told that we're supposed to now tell crowds that we're from the University of Arizona. Okay, uh, apparently that's uh, become a pet peeve. Any, any programming we do up here in Maricopa County, uh, there's that other university that's sometimes mentioned. <laughs> so in case you're not sure where you are, this is the University of Arizona. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Ron, for hosting the event. And uh, I hope to take questions at the end of this, but if you know me, I like to ask questions to start with. So I'm gonna ask some questions uh, to start with. Before we even get to the handout, this is just to lubricate your brain, okay? Um, can you all see these uh, leaves, even back there against my white shirt? Can you see that there's holes in them? I don't know if you can see that online or not. Can you all see that? <clears throat> All right, pass those around. <clears throat> Ron, this is your farm, so you should know what those are. <clears throat> but no embarrassment if you don't know, it's okay. This is a learning opportunity. <clears throat> you know, I don't know if you can see these. Can you see these from way back there? Probably can see some pale splotches here. <clears throat> if you look on this leaf, this is the fresh version of this. This is older damage, this is newer damage. I don't know, does this make any difference for you, Kyle? <clears throat> okay. Now, I mentioned it because this is both going on in his field right now, and these are two different animals doing, the, doing this damage. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what these are? <clears throat> it's not hail. Excellent. Yes. No, no, that's, Dan, let's be real. This is, I mean, if you saw Jesse's talk, at Desert Ag Conference, this is forensics, right? You have to, you have to rule out everything, right? It, sometimes it's a process of elimination. No, these are actual insect damage. All right. <clears throat> Any guesses? Is it where? Well, I noticed, I noticed Cash is conveniently on the phone, so he can't answer the can't answer the question. <laughs> we need some PCA participation. That's all right. <clears throat> I'm going to let you off the hook. <clears throat> we always find these beetles here on on Ron's thing on Ron's farm. Uh, they're just abundant in this area. So the one doing the shot holes, okay, not the surface etching, are these guys, and they're called Calascus beetles. <laughs> they're really of no consequence, honestly. Uh, a, a, a redundant plant like um, cotton can really withstand an awful lot of this shot holing without any, any consequence at all. So you never should get upset about it. Um, I saw a couple plants where they, they, they settled in on it and they did a lot of it. The plant is fine. Okay, so that's Calaspis beetles. You really don't see that too many places. I see it in this part of the county fairly often. There you go. That's right. It's all about heat stress. <clears throat> yeah. And then this etching, which this is now old, very common. Everybody has these, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in their early cotton, especially on the cotyledons. And uh, this, I, we didn't find any in our sweeps, but this is pale striped flea beetle. It's a pretty good sized flea beetle as flea beetles go. And uh, again, generally speaking, can make your, your cotton look pretty ratty. And there's guys that really don't like to see their cotyledons wrapped up in this too much. Um, generally of not much consequence, though it is true. If they get in, as soon as the cotyledons come out of the ground, <clears throat> there are those occasional situations where you might lose stand and, and uh, a remedial action might be needed quickly. So I need a handout. <clears throat> um, all right, so to the main topic, which is Thrive on Cotton. So uh, I, I wanna be clear, I realize that many of you don't have Thrive on Cotton yet, but it is out in limited acreages this year. Ron, do you have any Thrive on? Okay. Yeah. Many conditions on its use, and that's really, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an unregulated, uh, it's no longer regulated by, by EPA or USDA. So it's, it's fine to have in the environment, but uh, Bayer is being very cautious uh, because there are still export restrictions in certain countries. So that's why the, the extraordinary uh, uh, constraints. But Thrive on Cotton is gonna be here and it's gonna be here in everybody's, everybody's background. Next gen, Maricot has it, BASF, not yet, no, not yet. Um, but you know, many, many seed companies are licensing the trait from Bayer and it's gonna be in a number of uh, backgrounds. So it'll, it'll 
come available soon. And it's, uh, it's a new trait, a genetically engineered trait. It is a BT, but it's unlike any BT you've ever experienced in cotton before. We're up to bull guard three and uh, wide strike three and twin link plus we have three genes in them but they're all targeting your lep pest, your caterpillar pest. This targets ligus bugs. It also targets thrips, but we're past the thrips period of the season. So we're gonna spend time talking about ligus today. And uh, we put together this handout. It's a little odd. We're in a hybrid format. We got people online. Uh, we have the folks here, but the people online should be able to see this handout, I hope. Um, and uh, I've provided the notes there as well. So if I skip through some things, uh, you'll have the background on this. But suffice it to say, we have a huge investment in our cotton IPM programs here in Arizona. And it's to a point now where it's about, it's about as much about managing the beneficials in your system as it is the pests. Uh, that's unlike pretty much anywhere else in the cotton belt. So this is a pretty unique place to be growing cotton and, and protecting it from our pest problems. And Thrive On adds the arsenal that you have available to you. But because of this huge investment that we've made in the selectivity of our system, that's with our Bolgard and Twin Link Plus and uh, Y Strike 3 varieties, all those left genes, that's with all the white fly growth regulators and selective chemistries, all the other ligus control chemicals that we have that are also safe to beneficials. Those are huge investments by the industry to allow us to to enable conservation biological control. So we focus a lot on how these um, technologies can be fitted into our system and to examine whether they have any unintended impacts on our, on our beneficials. Now, if you're on the bottom of the first page, you'll see there's two key targets. You have our cotton plant and then ligus, and then you have thrips, Western flower thrips in particular. So Generally, we think of that as a secondary pest, not something you have to manage year over year. Uh, there are people that do attempt to manage Western flower thrips. I'm gonna just say, and then move on from it. I don't think you'll need to be doing any upgraded seed treatments or any foliar sprays for thrips here in the West. This isn't gonna be true in other parts of the belt and you'll see stories of coverage coming from other parts of the belt where they're gonna be asking for those seed treatments, asking for foliar sprays on top of Thrive on Cotton. We simply have too good of a growing conditions to, in most parts of the state where that'll ever be necessary. So please really talk to your seed suppliers and talk about, you know, I don't need the extra imidacloprid. I don't need the extra upgraded seed treatments. You're paying for something that you don't need, at least in terms of Western flower thrips. Now on panel number two on the second page, <clears throat> and, um, and, and we have a handout that covers the rest of the thrips topic. So we'll, we'll distribute that for you to take home with you. But as far as ligus goes, this is not like your bull guard cotton of original 1996. You put it out there and you never saw a pink form again. It's not that. Uh, it is a post plant resistance that's been engineered uh, through a BT that confers some protection to your plant. It doesn't eliminate all the ligus. It doesn't mean you're not going to scout for them. In fact, it's going to make your scouting a little more interesting, I think. Uh, it used to be we could just scout the numbers, and our thresholds were very, very solid on the numbers. You just, as soon as you hit the number, that's when you started spraying. That, those are your thresholds. Thresholds for your Thrive on Cotton will be a little more difficult to interpret and require some interpretation by your PCA and really paying attention to your plant. <clears throat> but from the one piece of data on that second panel, you'll see that on average, on average, we are reducing the ligus nymph days, and that's the same as degree days, only in, in measured in ligus terms, is, a, is down about 40% in Thrive on Cotton relative to non-Thrive on Cotton. So we're reducing that load of ligus on your plant by slowing their growth, by reducing their survival. And uh, some things we don't really know much about is their reproduction but certainly reducing their damage. Um, <clears throat> so really the, the key question becomes, okay, so you're telling me I may have to spray my Thrive on Cotton. And the answer is yes, you may have to spray your Thrive on Cotton. But like anything, you don't spray it unless the ligus are there. That's true of conventional cotton and, and Thrive on Cotton. But as a key pest, it's one that um, you're really gonna have to pay attention to carefully. So we have not done, even though we've been working with this trait for over a decade now, we've never run the specific trial to determine the threshold for ligus and thrive on cotton. 
I want that to be very clear. So everything I tell you from here on out is conjecture. It's maybe evidence-based. It may be based in my experience with the crop and, and this trait, but we don't have the definitive experimentation that says, ah, when you reach this level, that's time to go and you thrive on cotton. But if you look at the top of your third page, I'm gonna spend time on this, um, on this chart. <clears throat> I'm told I can do this to this whiteboard. So <clears throat> I don't know if this helps at all, but you know, if we look at, <clears throat> Here's, here's, I'm, I'm going to skip right over yield because you guys are not, I hate to tell you, you're not growing yield, you're growing money, right? So we're growing revenue. So we're really interested in the revenue curves. <clears throat> and then down here, think of this as just nymphs per hundred sweeps. Okay. Our conventional threshold is 15 total ligas with four to eight nymphs per hundred sweeps. That's for our conventional cotton, all right? And, and it's 15 totals, just to make sure there's enough total ligus in your field to warrant a spray. Uh, so really after that, you're paying attention to the nymphs in there. They're the ones responsible for the majority of the damage. So four to eight nymphs per hundred sweeps. So if you had seven adults and eight nymphs, that's 15 total with eight nymphs you'd be at a good time to spray your conventional cotton. Now there's a lot of guys that still use the four, but there's an awful lot of guys that use the eight. They use the upper end of that and have done very, very well with the chemistry we have. And managing it is just like managing, managing conventional cotton is, is really boiled down to either a carbine spray or a transform spray or alternating between the two. So years and years ago, we did very detailed threshold studies with conventional cotton. And what we got was a curve like that, which simply means the, 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 the longer you wait, and this is something like 30 nymphs over here, and this is zero nymphs here, the more cotton you lose, all right? It's a nice revenue curve. It's related to yield, of course, but obviously the more protective you are, I actually didn't draw this quite right. It actually comes down because when you start spending a lot of money to try to drive it to zero, you end up you know, spending way too much money. So I didn't draw that perfectly. It's better drawn on your, on your, on your uh, handout. <clears throat> so what I've done in that handout is I've produced a second curve. It's what it says predicted thrive on. Again, I don't have experimental evidence as this is rock solid, but all I did is I reduced the impact by 40%. Right, I told you it's 40 per, on average about a 40% difference between our conventional cotton and Thrive On. And so it looks something like this, it's flatter. So it should tell you two things. First of all, Thrive On is not immune. If you let it get up to 30 nymphs per hundred sweeps, you will suffer some, some yield loss and some lost revenue. But it's so much flatter, let's just say, and I'm, I'm not doing my, my chart justice, but um, for the interactive ability of this, we ended up with a, a, of a broad flat top here, conventionally of four to eight nymphs per hundred sweeps, right? And that's indicated on your chart. But if we sort of say, okay, so where does that actually end, us, end up on this new curve? We can see it's pretty broad and flat here. Your revenue is very good. We can actually read that off the bottom. And what does it come out to on the bottom? Anyone? About 14 nymphs. All right, so, so based on this older research that we did many years ago, I'm thinking that's not a bad guess. It's a guess. It's, a, it's based in this evidence, but not directly on Thrive On. It's indirect, suggesting that maybe we can go up to as high as 14 nymphs per 100. Now, some people are never totally, totally um, uh, comfortable with that. In fact, this, the original curve was optimized at 5.2. If you wanted to know the exact number, it was 5.2 nymphs. And we promoted a threshold of four to eight. Notice that's a little lower, right? It's a little more conservative. And in the same way, if we're saying 14 is the number, well, then maybe, maybe the answer is more like 12 to, 12 to 16 or something. And I think that sounds about reasonable. Now, that means you're going to see a lot of stuff in your net and you have to be able to tolerate them. But if you're looking for a ligus number, I think, and, and this is because it's a guesstimate, I'm really gonna say probably eight to 14 nymphs per hundred. 
<clears throat> since we don't have the direct evidence. So I don't think it wouldn't be much point in buying Thrive on cotton if you're spraying it exactly the same as your conventional cotton. Can we all agree to that? You're buying the Thrive on cotton for some ligus protection. Um, so I think you can at least start at the upper end of the normal threshold, which is eight, and probably take it even farther, maybe as far as 14 nymphs per hundred. Now that's seeing a lot of ligus in the net uh, and you may be uncomfortable with it. I'm uncomfortable with that close up view. Yeah. No, we don't know, honestly don't know. But as a revenue curve, again, forget the conventional, all that's gonna do is displace it up or displace it down based on the cost of the drive on because it's constant across all of these, right? But yeah, it's a great question. And it also assumes that the efficiency of your control system is the same. I'm gonna guess that carbine and transform, I'm gonna guess that carbine and transform are gonna work that much better in Thrive on Con because basically you have sickly ligus to begin with. So this is a very conservative estimate, I would say. But there may be, may be reasons to push it further. Now that's if you're desperate to have a number. If you want my, my uh, best guidance on this, I really think it's better, and that's covered in, in some of the, in the next slide, is we now need to do plant-based measurements. So you now need to pay attention to Randy if you want to understand how to manage ligus. You need to understand the plant. You need to know a, a couple of things. And a lot of you guys do this anyways, but now I'm gonna suggest you're gonna to have to be more systematic about it. And particularly the PCAs, walk and cotton, I think you need to count and measure your fruit retention. I don't know that it has to be the full fruit. It doesn't have to be the full plant. Most of your ligus damage is gonna occur in about the top five nodes. If all you did is looked at retention in the top five nodes, I think you'd be in good shape. You'd know whether you're, you're cresting. These are, these are baselines that Randy and Jeff created years and years and years ago. And there's a baseline for upland cotton and a baseline for, for Pima cotton. And that green line, you wanna just have your fruit retention tracking along that green line. If it's, uh, if it's uh, cresting up, it's always good to have heavy fruit retention, but you might wanna push it harder with nitrogen. If you're cresting below that baseline towards the lower white line, you need to then decide, has heat stress overcome my production such that I'm losing fruiting sites or am I experiencing ligus damage? Now, PCA should know the difference, right? Because he's seeing the ligus and he'll see flared squares. That's a picture of a flared square and a Pima square. You know, uh, these ligus are going after young squares and they'll, there's, this one has one, two, three, I think three ligus on it. Um, they're, they're piercing those young squares and in response, the plant starts to flare, the bracts start to turn yellow, and that, that square will eventually fall off. I think if you're seeing that at high levels, your fruit retention has dropped precipitously and it's not due to heat stress, even if your numbers aren't this high, I'd be starting to think, eh, maybe I should be spraying my Thrive on cotton because I'm, I'm taking on damage that I, I can't account for. Yeah, this goes back to the 70s. Correct. That's absolutely right, Bruce. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah, so you go back to the 70s, we used to promote a, a fruit retention. Ah, uh, Bruce is simply making the point that um, they used to measure uh, fruit retention uh, going back way back. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Bruce is simply making the point that the bugs don't always correlate perfectly with yield. When we did the work 20 years ago, it actually did produce this very nice curve. But even then, I'd always ask you to take a look at the plant because sometimes you could be surprised. You know, I, I, well, I think looking at first positions is good, but honestly, a good scout that's out there is going to spot the, the it's going to see shed squares, blasted squares in his net, and he's also going to see flared squares. You're going to see them coming out on the, I'm not talking about bloom tags for shed bowls. That's going to be a heat stress event, okay? Ligus, you're talking about lost sites due to square loss. Heat stress, you're going to see a lot of those one and two day bowls floating down the, 
down the, the water. Yeah. No, unfortunately not. No, counting, doing visual counting is different from the sweeping. We don't really have an equivalency. But if you're doing this, if you're doing the square counting, then it's a matter of looking at your baselines. If you're crashing below uh, and, and you're seeing flared squares, even minus the sweeps, you, you might need to call up a spray. It is. Yeah, I wouldn't be concentrating anywhere where you've already set bowls. You're really talking about your square, your square sites up above. And usually those first couple of sites are almost gimmies, right? There's not enough time for them to shed, even if they've been damaged, unless they're blasted and they turn black. Uh, the very top, the very, you know, first and second node. So really, I kind of like looking at nodes three, four, five, six in there. You know, that's where you're going to see those half-grown squares and they, they should be flaring. From the top, yep, counting from the top. I tell a, a lie to that. Bruce, we. They had the, the master lease blast, and everybody was sub, everybody was subleasing by them, and it was was subleasing from them. They had a bunch of seed out of the alphabet, and they didn't want to put the money in the spray. And these Ligus numbers got. Horrendous, but all the growers, you know, they had a committee and they had a program down there and they were paying attention to a bunch of college kids that were numbers and everything was okay. We got a number for the and all of a sudden these plants just boom and they just went totally ape shit and they got big things sticking out there. And all the first time we said, We got to that. And it was so bad that the year before it made what was then an astronomical yield. It yield. That year was 51% of what the previous yield was. And everybody up and down that road there was the same thing. And it hurt the shit out of Stevens because they were gin in the cot. I just thought I'd tell that story. There's a little humor in the story too. Clean it up, Bruce. We're, we're broadcasting. <laughs> yeah, no, it, Bruce makes an excellent point. You have to look at your community. And if you're growing seed alfalfa nearby, you need to be aware that's a major source and of ligas. Yeah, a, a donated spray to your to your to your neighbor is probably worth more than waiting until they get to your cotton. Yes, yeah, safflower is a good source. Yeah. And this was a total wreck. <clears throat> if I had looked at that cotton, and it had been a little while when I went down there and looked at it, how bad it was. And I thought, and I mean, it was a total wreck, and it got stupid, and they couldn't fix it. You know, the metabolism got messed up. They couldn't fix it. Like I say, twelve hundred some pounds one year, and 2,500 the year before, or the year before was a good year, but I mean, 1,200 but didn't pay the freight down there. Yeah. And Jake lost all his bales in the Uchen, and so, you know, it caught every, everybody lost on that deal. Yeah, yeah it's a tough deal. If you're, if you're in a bad uh, situation like that, Thrive On is not going to pull you out of this. It's not like Bulgard Cotton. You, you'll, need, you'll, need to be, you'll need to be watching it. So we're passing around Lagos adults, large nymphs, and small nymphs. Now we're doing that for a couple of reasons. One, everybody should know what a ligus looks like, right? Has a nice little heart on its back on the adults. Uh, but you should look at the nymphs too, and especially the small, uh, the large nymphs, because I would also su suggest to you that if you're picking up those counts, even if you're up in this range and they're all small, they're really the small nymphs in the Thrive On, I give them more time to work because those are the susceptible stages. If they're reaching those larger nymphs, they're kind of they're escaping the thrive on and that's another indicator that maybe you need to supplement with a transform or carbine spray um, so it's really important to sort of know the difference between those small nymphs and large nymphs the larger nymphs actually have developing wing pads if you look on their back i know you can't see them in there too well but if you look at the nymph i'm not a very good artist but they start to develop these wing pads those would be large nymphs. If you can see those wing pads, it's a large nymph. If they don't have those wing pads, then it's a small nymph. Uh, lastly, 
We have invested a lot in the last couple of years, or really the last 20 years, and Steve Nerano from USDA is here as well. We've done research for two decades easily on the on the role that beneficials play in your 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 cotton pest management program, in, in particular in supplying biological control. And we have released um, guidelines for counting those predators. And I would encourage you to do it. Um, probably the most abundant organisms in here in, in Ron's cotton right now are beneficial. We Have you put, passed out the rest of them? All right, so we got colops beetle, pass the colops beetles first. They're very abundant out here. And colops beetles are very efficient predators. They're excellent white fly predators hard for a pest really to gain a foothold in this. Uh, literature online for you to help guide that. Well, I was going to say, for anybody that's, uh, for anybody that's got a surplus of hand sanitizer, this is the best stuff to, to put your, your samples in. So just load up some vials, take them with you. You know, don't call Peter, you know, at the end of the day and say, well, I saw this thing flying across the field. It was kind of red and had stripes. What is it? Capture it, throw it into a vial with some hand sanitizer and you've got it perfectly preserved for our needs, okay? Perfectly preserved, all right? And they're easy to look at, right? You can put your lens, Turn your lens over and you can you can look things over. Um, is there any evidence that fried on Let's be clear about this. No. Okay. <laughs> no, there is no evidence. None whatsoever. Believe me. If Monsanto and now Bear knew there was evidence of stink bug control, that would be a billion dollar gene. We, we would love to have that. But no, unfortunately, there's no impact on anything but Ligus hesperus, which is the main Ligus we have, and Ligus linealaris, which is the one east of us, but it's also present here in alfalfa. Um, we still are having an active debate as to whether there's any efficacy against cotton flea hopper. Cotton flea hopper isn't a major pest, but I know I think you've sprayed it a couple of times up in this area before, right, Cash? So there are times when cotton flea hopper, especially on this young stuff trying to square, that they're all getting blasted. Uh, I would not count on Thrive on, on that yet. We, we tried for years and never really could measure a direct effect, but the jury is still out on that. So Ligus and then only Franklinella, if you like to say words, Franklinella with me, Franklinella, thrips okay that's western flower thrips it won't impact the predatory thrips it won't uh, uh it won't affect the other even pest thrips that are outside of the genus franklinella um so for us that's western flower thrips and i and i i, I should close i'm probably over my time but i, I do want to say western flower thrips play an important beneficial role they are a predator in our system so especially at this stage onward, thrips are in there suppressing mites and white flies the entire time. So there's, there's this unusual relationship. Thrivon will reduce your thrips in your Thrivon cotton, and that may um, reduce some of the mite biological control that was possible with them. Thank you, Peter. Okay, uh, uh, Kyle's asking you to mention the shorts. We do yeah. have copies that we're going to send out. We're going to pass out here locally, but it's online. Are you going to give them the URL? Uh, Kyle's going to provide the URL to the two IPM shorts that cover this thrift biological control of mites, a little more detail, and then our cotton insecticide use guide that covers the selectivity of our insecticide. We really want you to pay attention. Both those will pass those out here locally. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Peter. Okay, next we'll have Randy Norton, and he will discuss with us in season management of cotton growth and development. Randy, it's your time now. Peter, the reason I asked about stingbugs, I see there's quite a few in that corn. Yes. 